Psalm 84. And uh, I was informed that this semester we will actually go pretty much to the end of uh, September, which is, I don't know how many classes I've taught, but you can be assured I have enough to finish the course. <laughs> We're not going to run out of steam. <clears throat> All right, Psalm 84. <clears throat> Before we start in Psalm 84, <clears throat> I would like to take a moment to give a couple of pictures of the house of God, and this, this psalm is dealing with that. To do that, I'm going to take this out of the holder. And all of the work that Shay did to get it perfect, and it was perfect. <laughs> and just to show you, um, <clears throat> there's, there's sort of two different sides to this, but they all play into one another when we talk about the house of God. One which we are very familiar with. Yeah? Is that 39 or I'm sorry, Psalm 84, did 84, I? 84, I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. Uh, house, house of God. House of God. Of God, um, and that is the, the the most common and the most understood reality of the house of God is us. I'll draw a little circle here and write us in there, or that can be an individual, that can be a believer. You could say our body. We are a habitation of God. We are God's house, and that God lives in us. Jesus lives in us. Okay. Anybody not familiar with that concept? <laughs> okay. That's the one that we are very, very familiar with. But there's another side, <clears throat> and uh, in my sharings that I've been doing on the, house, on the habitation of God, <clears throat> I'll probably get into this. But I think for this psalm, it needs to be seen and understood <clears throat> that there is also, so I'm going to erase this small believer that's a house of God because God lives in him. He's the habitation of God. <clears throat> and I'm going to draw a larger circle. And that circle <clears throat> is Christ, okay? It's Jesus. And, and we're familiar with the, the, the term in Christ, being in Christ. We are in Christ. And that is a concept that means that all believers, and you could draw you know, a billion little circles in there, and all believers are in Christ. And the full meaning of that is, is that we are in union with Christ. Okay? I mean, that's the, that's the real, I mean, if we miss that, then any concept of in Christ is just strictly theology. But here, there are many members in here, so I'll just draw a bunch of circles and I won't fill up the whole thing. It looks like a pomegranate, which I've taught on many times. But the house of God as seen by us being in Christ is this reality that in a certain sense, the, the whole body, the whole thing is Christ. <laughs> And we're one with him, and it's his life in us. Amen? But it's his life in all of us. And we only exist as, as believers because we believe in union with Christ. We believe in our oneness with him and that we're identified there. <clears throat> okay. So um, the, the house or the temple <clears throat> is Christ because we're all joined to him. But really, he's not the house. We're the house. But we're joined to him, so it's Christ. Is that, is that confusing or is that, is that clear? He, I mean, this is all, this in Christ thing, this is all him. Every believer is joined to him, and therefore they are one with Jesus. Okay? But in reality, he's living in all of those, and by doing that, we're the house, and he really is the one who is the life within, 
Now we understand that on an individual basis, but there is this great reality of in, in, in union with Christ and, and drawing from that. And so um, to, to dwell, you're familiar with the psalm that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To dwell in the house of the Lord, you know, I, I have traded out my billfold to this one which is just a smaller version of my other one without the star, but it doesn't stick out as high so that I can't put this microphone cord behind it, and it's not really that good. <clears throat> anyway, so um, when it's talking about dwelling in the house of the Lord, it's talking about dwelling in Christ, it, when this, these scriptures are. Because there is this reality of Christ dwelling in us, and that would be uh, an, an individual concept of, of realizing that. But dwelling in the house of the Lord is, and, and I'll get into this in the habitation thing eventually, us being living stones, okay, that make up the house. So I'm not going to try to fully explain everything right now, but I just wanted to set the stage for this particular um, sharing because this desire on the part of the writer here is relating to both Christ dwelling in him but primarily him being a part of this reality of this uh, bigger, I'll, I'll call it bigger structure, this temple, this uh, identification into Christ. So when he starts off in uh, Psalm 84, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. He's, he, is, he is recognizing the beauty of this larger temple, this house, this temple. He's recognizing the beauty of it in many aspects. He's recognizing the beauty of it in what union with Jesus brings us or what union with br Jesus brings us out of. All right. Now let me just ask you right now. Does anybody have a, a personal problem you're dealing with in your own life? Okay. I would assume at least two or three of you might. Um, and, and, the true, and the true answer. See, we look so many places for answers. We should look under the Lord. We should look to the Lord. Because the answer isn't fixing something or putting new wine into an old wineskin that'll just break and lose the whole contents, but becoming part of something that is stable, permanent, the house of God, the, the, the temple of God. So, um, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now, isn't it good that our heart and flesh, both of them are crying out? Our flesh is going, I can't stand this. I got to have some, you know, that's our flesh. But if you'll check deeper, deeper than the surface, surface reactions, probably your heart is crying out too. Have you ever, your flesh is just going, I can't stand this, God, you got to do something, and just reacting and stuff like that and thought, you know, this is just making it worse because I'm just seeing how bad I really am. But if you will see what is true of him, let me say it like this, you will see what is true of you now, just you're not acting like. You are one with Jesus, with the risen, living Christ. Okay? So, uh, let me read some of my notes here. David rejoices in the house of God. He loved the house of God because it brought fulfillment to the Lord and rest. It brings rest to the Lord. <clears throat> we are the fulfillment of that place of habitation and rest for God. David's heart. And I'm saying, you know, here's the deal. I'm saying David, I, I had told to you before the the introduction says to the chief priest uh, to the chief musician upon Giddeth a psalm for the sons of Korah a 
And there were sons of Korah set up by David. And this doesn't say a psalm by the sons of Korah. So it could be that the sons of Korah wrote this, or it could be David wrote it and gave it to them. Okay. Now for me, sometimes I say David wrote this because I hear that same heart, almost the exact same thing I've heard in other psalms that clearly said David. That heart. And, and much of the wording being the same way. So that's, if I say David, uh, don't hold my feet to the fire, uh, but I, at times I sense that that, that is David's heart uh, coming out there. All right, so I said uh, his heart and his flesh cried out, not for the house, but for who was found there. Who lives in that house? But, but he knows that God and the house are tied together, and this will be an eternal fact. God and the house are tied together. I don't know that God and the healer are going to be tied together forever. I don't know if we'll need healing, you know, 800 billion years from now. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know if God and the Savior are tied together, but I know God and the house are tied together because that's something that he desired. He desired Zion. Zion. He hath desired it for a habitation. <clears throat> and so, and David's the one who really spots, spotted that first. <clears throat> um, David, as an exile, desires to feel security at home with God in his house. And the reason why I say that is I want you to notice the, the writer here starts, How amiable are thy tabernacles? And, of course, he's talking about the Lord of hosts, so this is the individual ones. But then, verse 2, My soul longeth, even faded, for the courts of God. So I'm going to say that I, I think that, that the writer of this psalm like David and some of the other ones that we dealt with, he might be in exile at this time. He might be on the run. He, is not, he does not have access to Zion, and it does bring up Zion in this psalm. He does not have access to Zion at this moment uh, because of the circumstances. And so uh, for him, for David, um, much of his writings, much of his songs are about the Lord in Zion. Much of it is. So he's, he knows, I mean, David was a shepherd boy out in the fields when he was real young. I mean, like a teenager. And he came and, and, he, and he met God. I mean, he knew God was there. He communed with God out there in the pastures when he was taking care of his father's sheep. Amen or not? Okay, absolutely true. But David grew fond of having Zion in his backyard, if you will, being able to have direct access, being in relationship, living with, I'm going to say it like this, living with the God who lived in his living room. And I'm talking about God living in his own living room. And so this psalm is going to bring out some of these themes about this, this separation between God in general and God of Zion. And of what was special to David, because here he is, he's on the run. If it was Absalom or whatever, God was still with David. Amen? Amen. But in the other psalm we went over, in this one and many others, man, he's, he is not content. He is longing after the, and he describes him as the living God, not the religious God. Okay? And um, so, uh, David, as an exile, desires to feel securely at home with God in his house. The living God is found in the place where he lives. Make sense? Uh, in other words, he's not seeking the religious God. He's not seeking 
the Lord on a religious level. He's seeking the Lord in his home. He's seeking the Lord. He's seeking God in God's own dwelling place. And, uh, and because he wants to dwell where God dwells. All right, so verse 3 Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may, excuse me, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. So he's talking about how, how beautiful are your tabernacles, speaking as the Lord of hosts over many. And then he's saying, I long for your courts. And then he brings up this stuff about birds. Because he's talking about this thing of having a home. Even the swallows, even the sparrows have a home. Even they have a home. <coughs> and, and here David doesn't have a home again. He's on the run. But God has a home. And how lovely is that? And even the birds have a home. And not only that, they have a home in his home. And he's, he's longing after that in the spirit. So I wrote, his rejoicing is over that of finding a home. The sparrow and swallow have found a home. The psalmist says that small birds can live in the temple, but he is far away. My heart and my flesh long my soul longs yea even faints for the court of god yes Well, and the thing is, he's, uh, I, I wrote, he, he envied the birds which dwelt in the house of God. These birds found sanctuary, but David was longing for it. He knew the beauty of finding rest in Christ. He knew the beauty of identification there. Not just identification with Jehovah God that is somewhere in a field or uh, am I starting to make a little bit of a division here between God in general and the God of Zion? <clears throat> he envied even these birds. <clears throat> and um, I wrote, consider what they did. They found a home, a comfortable, suitable, permanent abode, these birds did. Uh, some people are like swallows because there is a difference between a swallow and a sparrow. You know, swallows fly great distances. And they, you know, they're, they're on the wing a lot. Whereas sparrows, you don't, I mean, they fly a little bit and then they land and stuff like that. So we're dealing with two different kinds of birds. And I was reminded, I never looked it up, but I was reminded of Jesus' words. Jesus said, he was trying to tell us how important we were, and he said, um, uh, are not what was it five sparrows worth a farthing and are you not worth much more than sparrows and stuff like that <clears throat> he's basically saying they're not really worth a lot you know you can get five of them for a farthing I don't know how much a farthing is but I don't think it's I think it's like a penny or something like that it's not much and so but but you know, as Kelly was saying, uh, they're, they're important enough to God. And I think I wrote that here, too. Um, I wrote, some people are like swallows. They live on the wing, and they are not so much in need of a home for themselves, but they need a nest for their young. They, need, they long to see their young settled and happy and safe in God. Safe in God. And so they, they came in. They built a home inside of this place that God himself is identified with and is called by his own name. And now he's saying, look at this. They're there. 
They're happy. They're secure. They're not being chased off. Uh, I, it was a, a law written way after the Bible, but the, the rabbis made a law that if birds ever made a nest in the, in the temple or something like that, that you couldn't chase them off. <laughs> well, that's probably pretty good because if you find your identification in here, this is where your identification is, and you settle on being found in him, you settle on not, not uh, primarily focusing on your individual life on this earth, uh, that my identification is my hair is this go, you know, this long or whatever, and my eyes are this color, and I act this way, and my interests are, you know, I mean, you know, I've seen people, you know, you come up and you say, well, I want to get to know you. Tell me something about yourself. Well, my favorite color is this, and my favorite this is that, and my favorite that is that, and stuff like that, and and uh, you know, I've seen people change favorite colors before. You know, they didn't hold to that their whole life. I've seen people change even music styles and whatever from one to another. And, you know, you go, well, you know, you hated country. What are you doing listening to that? I really like it now. And you're just kind of going, well, that's not you. No, that's what they told you they were before and that they didn't like that and now they do, you know. <clears throat> Um, anyway, my mind goes to many things. And <clears throat> I will not go there. <clears throat> um, again, I wrote, these, these birds found sanctuary, but David longed for it. David was longing back to get back into this union and this relationship and this and to stop being floaty stop being outside of it he knew that to God the house was wonderful that God loved the house he knew that to God he he just found such comfort here and so that God wants us to come back to find our rest there again to to be identified with him and to, as his house and then a comfort zone comes. I mean, let's face it, you ever visit, uh, I don't know what Jim's like, but if you probably visited him at his office up there, he's probably a little more business-like, you know, and stuff like that. Whereas if you just popped in at his house over there, hey, want some coffee? Some <laughs> you know, <clears throat> probably two different things. Well, I think that's kind of what, I mean, that was what I was getting out of this psalm, that God, David's going, I want to know the living God. I want to want, know the one who's living in his house and how he's relating to us there in this relaxed setting where he is most comfortable, honestly, where he is most happy. <clears throat> and what is the bottom line of that? Folks, that's, forget the pie in the sky. That's just a simple truth that he wants us. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you and where I, that, that where I go, you may be also. Now, we can read that and say, well, he goes, that's where he wants us to be. But it's more than that. Where I go, you may be, and you find your being. In him we live, in him, not with him or around him. In him we live and move and have our being. And, and uh, he loves it when we're identified with him. And it's just, uh, it's just hard because he, he died so that sin wouldn't be an issue. He died and rose again so that we could be one with him. And he doesn't want us all fretting apart from him. He wants us to come in. You know, what does it say in Hebrews? Come boldly. You know, we go, oh, yeah, but I've, I've really messed up. Well, I've really made a way. You know, I mean, that's the way he looks at it. And I really believe that with all my heart. I really believe that he's, he's settled all this stuff. And he's waiting for us to just say, yes, Lord, and sit down and act like nothing happened. And, and you'll understand what I mean. I mean, yeah, get stuff under the blood. You know, if you sin, just say, I sin, get it under the blood and go on. Don't waller in it. You know, there's, there's an old thing uh, from, from Pentecostal churches and stuff from many, 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 many years before most of you here, but 
where if you sinned, you had to wallow in that sin. You had to wallow in it for, for a long time before God was going to get back in a mood for accepting you. Well, there's a good thing about God. He settled everything. It's settled. It's already settled. See, it's not like Jesus is sitting there on the throne, you know, and he's sitting there and he goes, oops, you sinned, okay, and uh, excuse me, I've got to go out and die on the cross for you. He didn't do that. He's already done that. It's like, look, it's already settled. Let's see. Let me look up your sin. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I took care of that, let's see, uh, 2,000 years ago. I mean, does that make sense? You know, and to rest. And that's what, you know, we enter into his rest. And that's called being his house. Being, and there's another word for house in the, in the Old Testament, family, of the house of Abraham. You know, it's all tied in one in the biblical understanding. It's not in our modern day, but if you see it in the biblical understanding, your family, you are his house. <clears throat> all right. So, um, <clears throat> and then uh, something that Kelly had said, even the least creatures God cares for, because that's the sparrows, they show us that God put... Uh, and, I mean, God allowed this, those sparrows to come into the house. But even in the least of creatures, he put the desire, the need for a stable, permanent, safe home. Can I get amen? Okay. Uh, you know, I was raised in an orphanage. You didn't have that. You, there's no way. You know, I mean, you just didn't have it. I mean, the house parents would come and go and, you know, get shifted around there were a lot of different dorms and stuff like that you didn't have that kind of stability and so it it, it makes a difference it does make a difference but in my case when I found my home when I found the place I I could find rest everything just started mellowing out everything you know things could just be happening all around me and before I was, you know, my hands would just shake and everything, and I was just a wreck because I, I didn't know. There was no stability in this earth. Well, I found a stability, and it's still not in the earth, but it brings stability to your earth life. You know, I found my rest. I found my home. I found where I'm accepted no matter what. Does that... You know, you don't have to earn it. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. <clears throat> um, and then I was thinking about these birds, that they are at home at, in the altar. Uh, instead of running from death, from death, they found a home there. <clears throat> and... There is a reality because there's a lot of death that goes on in that altar. And yet at that very altar, they've found life because it says bringing forth their young. There is life out of death. And they've found that principle. Because it could have said they, they, they nested anywhere, couldn't it? But it says they nested in the altar because there is life out of death. And, you know... Uh, for, for any of you that hold on to this truth that there is life out of death, and there is, for any of you that hold on to it, you, you will probably, you know, probably not as long as I'm alive, you won't be persecuted for it. But when I go, there's going to, another target will be <laughs> worked for. And... Uh, <clears throat> But even that is an opportunity for life out of death. When, when they turn or they, they accuse or something like that, that's where you say the only hope for them is life out of death. Now, remembering this, of course, it's not your death that brings life out of. It is the dying of the Lord Jesus. We bear about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus. And as long as we 
are one with him, and that's why this oneness is so important in dwelling in his house, because if we are living stones, then all that is true of him in his house becomes true of, of the greater structure, and I think I even get into that later. Yes? And that's, that's a good point. I don't know how I, well. Do you think that picked up, Scott, what she was saying? Uh, Did you see anything kind of going like this? Does it say? <laughs> anyway, what she was saying is that, and, and, and how true, there is this difference between dwelling in the altar and looking at it from the outside. When you look at it from the outside, it looks like just death and slaughter and everything else. But dwelling in the Lamb, dwelling in oneness with Him, folks, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, people that preach this, they're, they're just miserable all the time. I was told that by somebody whose life has just been nothing but miserable since they've turned against that reality. Honestly, I mean, I'm not talking about miserable. I'm talking about just uh, everything's almost to the point of insanity. You know, because they wanted the freedom of not having to deal with the altar. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to come through the tabernacle. I'm going to skip the altar. I'm going to skip the labor. I'm going to skip this. I'm just going to run in the holy of holies and dance around. Well, that's real good, but folks, there was a death when David did that. But David had already come to the death, okay? Because there ain't no flesh going to glory in his presence. That's just the way that it is, and that. To do that, you come through the cross. And, you know, let me make it clear, everything that is alive in Jesus came through that cross, <laughs> okay? You say, yeah, but that's your doctrine. That's the Bible. All right. So, uh, and then, uh, let's see, verse... Uh, Well, it's talking about these uh, sparrows and swallows laying their young, even in the altars. And then verse 4 says, Blessed are they who dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. Um, what are they blessed about? What are they praising about? And I wrote, this, show, this verse shows that the blessing of those who dwell in God's house are those of the last verse, which deals with, with flight and fruitfulness of the birds and of this reality of stability of finding a place in the altar. Uh, this is the true blessing. Now, we want to just, we just want to quote that verse and say, you know, oh, this is, you know, this is the blessing of the Lord. Uh, uh, blessed are they who dwell in thy house. But it just described who, what, you see what I'm saying? It just described who he's talking about, the birds who have, are laying there young and they've found peace and they found a home in God's home. They found a home in God's home. They found a home in oneness with the Lord and it's, to them it's so satisfying. It's crazy that people try to take that away from you. It's so satisfying to have found that. And so, um, uh, I wrote, it's, it's not about events, but about dwelling or abiding. Because verse 4, blessed are they who dwell in thy house. Just consider that thought. I mean, if this is the house, if this being in Christ is the house, blessed are they who dwell in Christ. What does is, what is Ephesians say? That we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All, 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 not way up there, but in Christ or in union with Christ. All of these things are real. So the blessing of this, folks, and we're in Psalm 84, but the blessing of this is not 
that God is randomly blessing your lives. And the average basic teaching is, well, do you want to be blessed? Well, just come down to the front and let me lay hands on you and your whole life's going to be changed. Okay. But he's saying, the bless, blessed are they who dwell, and I just love the wording of that, blessed are they who dwell in thy house, who dwell in this place of union, who dwell in this place where, and here's what we mean when we say in union, where all of the resources that are him, not all, you know, let me, let me, not all of his resources, as if he sits on a throne and all around him are all these resources and he throws them at you. We'll see that in just, just a minute. There is a relating that you can do to God in general, in general. But the, the main blessings of the resources, not that are sitting around him, that's the God in general, but the resources of his being, the resources of patience, the resources of hope, the resources of, of love, the resources of, you see what I mean? Those only come by union, just like a branch will get those from the vine. They only come by union. They only come by dwelling in the house. They don't come by never going to the house and just calling upon God in general. Okay. That we're starting to divide just a little more now. This difference that this psalm is bringing out about God in general and the God of Zion. The God that loves and delights in us to relate to him in Zion. That loves for us to love him back. Coming, isn't that what a bride does? She comes into his house. You know, she comes into his house. <clears throat> All right, so um, uh, it is not about events, but about dwelling, with, dwelling in the house of God. Blessed are they who dwell in the house of God. Um, We are living stones, and I'm not going to get into that, but I will at some other time. Um, when it, and listen, listen to this, and I want you to keep in mind. Well, let me read verse 3 into 4, and then let me emphasize the last part, and you tell me if, if I might be right on this. Yea, the sparrow hath found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God, blessed are they who dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. I heard that as these, that this was a continuation of verse 3, that he's talking about these birds that have found a home and that they're blessed in dwelling in his house, that he's actually continuing the thought, and they're sitting and they're singing and praising him. And I can just hear people walking into the temple or walking into the tabernacle and you hear all these birds singing and they're just singing and you're going, they're, they're still praising you. Uh, we have two birds at, at home that belong to Deb, two lovebirds. And this afternoon, I have no clue what set them off. But I mean, and I'm upstairs, and I mean, they just decided they wanted to sing. And they just, singing and all and, all, and I mean it's just two of them but my god it sounds like a choir and I mean oh, the sound is raising and I'm going oh man there's something has made them happy but I was searching this at that moment and I thought I thought that's the sound that they heard when they came into the temple they heard these birds chirping and singing and happy in and he's saying, blessed are they that dwell in the house of the Lord. They shall yet be praising him. Can you, I mean, do you see that I may not be wrong there? Because the flow is perfect. It, there is no real break in that thing. <clears throat> so, um, so I said, this sounds like the birds singing. With the birds in mind, he does not speak of visiting the temple, but those who dwell. People would come into the temple and do stuff and leave. 
but the birds in their little mind, this is my house. This is God's house. This is my house. Do you understand? And they would visit, but the birds would dwell. And that, so that's what I started seeing, that this whole thing was a flow out of one verse into the other, which, what do we call that? Context. <laughs> Instead of just pulling things out and making them say different things. And then I was noticing from that verse that there, you know, there are different words for the, the temple throughout this. I mean, thy, thy tabernacles, thy, uh, for the courts of the Lord, um, uh, the house of the Lord, God's house, your house. Um, there's all these references to this being God's house and us being, you know, David or whoever wrote this, how amiable is that house and then he says my soul longs to be back there to be in that union again and I, I see that as sometimes we get off and sometimes we get out of the we get out of whack with the union of the thing and then it all turns on us you know what I mean it's like attacking badgers you know, and they go at you and try to destroy you, and they pick and bite and and you know, all this kind of stuff. And and I've noticed that if a person has a natural tendency to look for small, minute things that they could see the Lord in, if that's a natural tendency, not not necessarily led of the Holy Spirit, but they go, oh, I just found something good, or oh, you know, they have that that natural ability to find things and point out things that that natural ability will turn on them if they're not careful when they're not flowing with the Lord and it'll find things in themselves and pick out and point and draw out and make, you know, make those big and everything else. That's why David said, and I think David, I mean, read a lot of his Psalms, the guy had lots of problems. You know, it wasn't like he was perfect, okay? His mind could get off and he could go, oh, you know, oh, God, my enemies and this and that, and I've done the same thing. That's why he saw the benefit of dwelling in union, in, in union with the Lord and drawing from the Lord's resources. The Lord, I, you know, I have no patience. The Lord is my patience because I'm in union with him. And so you get in a situation and you just admit it. You go, I have no patience, but Lord, you are my patience. And I'm going to believe right now that you can actually come through me because I am in union with you and you are my life. Right? And this is a, this is a major theme here throughout. And you'll see it right to the very end. It's a major theme of, of, of sticking with the Lord and of drawing back to those places and so what what the writer here is doing is he's calling to remembrance he's washing it's almost like he's washing his own mind you know from all the filthy thoughts of separation and of failure and of everything else and he's saying oh i know where my place is my place my place is in the house of god in the courts of god to walk those courts again to be to walk in union with him, to walk in harmony, to walk in, in fullness of life with him. And then when you do that, it fixes a lot of other stuff, which we'll see in uh, just a few verses down. All right, so verse 5. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Isn't that what I just spoke? Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. In whose heart are the ways of them? I'm going to read. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep. I'm going to read five, six, and seven because I think they go together. Who passing through the valley of Baca, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. All right. So. Um, The, and he's, he's using the word blessed again. Uh, he, used the, he started verse 4 with that. He's starting verse blessed. So there's another blessing that it's talking about here. And uh, that blessing is those whose strength is in the Lord. All right. Um, I, I've said this before. I don't know how clear it gets to anybody. 
Some people think I'm a real strong person, and I don't. I believe I'm a really, 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 really weak person. And I, I just, I, you don't have to live with me. And even Deb lives with me, but I live in me. And for me to find the Lord as my strength is almost, um, it, it's not a luxury. It's, it's a necessity because I just faint so easily. But when, the, when I'm attached, do you know what I mean? <laughs> when I'm attached to the Lord, there comes into me, it's like I feel strong, but I, it's not my strength. You know, be strong in the Lord. Didn't you say be strong? Don't, don't, it didn't say be strong for the Lord. It says be strong in union with the Lord. And there, all of a sudden, the vine, which has the roots, you know, because have you ever said to yourself, I don't seem to have much roots. Well, branches don't. The vine does. I don't seem to have much roots, but... We're not the ones that has it. He's got the roots. And he is so rooted in the Father. He is so rooted in the truth. I mean, can you see, the, if you could just see the massive roots that he has in everything that we would ever want, and then give up trying to be rooted like that and just try to make one rooting, and that is to be rooted, fastened, abiding, held into the vine itself. And all that he holds on to flows up through him by life and into you by his life. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if we got that or not, but she was just saying, and I, I've got that in my notes later on, but it is this reality that if you're in the house, then the foundation is yours. And all of the strength that it has, and all of the, the assets that are of the house, this being the house of God and being his house, and all of, of his foundation, though, because he's the, he's the foundation of the, and the chief cornerstone of the whole thing, Paul said, there's no other foundation than I can lay than Jesus Christ. All that is, that, all the founding that he has, he's founded in the Father. He's founded in the truth. He's founded on a rock. And, and, and if we go out and try to produce that, we'll never be that in ourselves. But we, and so you go out of the house, and then you get lost, and then you try to produce something, and then the wind and the waves come upon you and knock it all down, remember, you know, and then the, it knocks everything down, and, and, uh, and then you have to go back to him. And you go, Lord, you're my everything. You're my everything. Now, now, let me give you a little example of something. We could say, well, if you would die to yourself, Jesus would fill you. You understand what I'm saying? If you'd empty your vessel, then Jesus would fill you. Okay? Okay, or you could say, if you die to yourself, Jesus would live. Okay? Or you could just say, um, if you just return to the Lord, you know, I'll speak like a prophet now. No cross, no, just return to the Lord. Just come back in and let the Lord be your shelter. I'm, you know, I'm not stuck on terminology. And so here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. The bottom line is, it's got to be Jesus. <laughs> well, it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be Jesus. We were joined to him. He came into us. And Jesus said, at that day, you're going to know this. What day? He, they were already disciples. He was already talking to them. But at a certain day, the disciples are going to know that I am in you and you are in me. 
Wait for the day to dawn. Wait for the day. Wait for the light to come. At that day, you'll get it. You know? And the terminology doesn't matter. It doesn't. The bottom line is, if a heart wants Jesus, he'll do whatever he has to do to get hold of Jesus. And if you've wandered outside of the, the house, you've wandered outside of the realm in which uh, in which all you have is God in general instead of the God of the house, then you'll get general, you'll give general prayers and you'll get general help, but it won't be the overcoming life, it won't be the delight that he has in Zion, it won't be the overflow, and all of that is in this psalm, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit. It won't be all of that, because it's in this house that he's provided everything. Because he made us one with himself. And he'll not, for, you know, can he deny himself? Can he? Can he deny himself? No, he won't. He can't. Okay, well, guess who you are? Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You say, well, I don't know how much bone, but I sure am flesh. <laughs> well, at least you're his flesh. Right? At least you're his flesh. I mean, you know, the woman who, you know, Jesus said, I'm, I can't feed you the, you know, the, the stuff on the table belongs to the house of Israel. And she was from another nation. And she said, yeah, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus went, I have not seen such faith. She's still identified. Even if she's saying she's a dog, she's saying, I'm your dog. And you ought to take care of me. Hey, dog. Right? And this is, this, is a, this is a hard thing. And that example is a beautiful one because it's one of the few times Jesus got excited about something. He got excited. He says, I haven't seen faith like this. No, not in Israel. Look at this. She's identifying totally with me. And he loved it. He didn't go, well, you scroungy little mutt, you know, mangy thing. You get out. You know, here, here she comes in. Now go. You know. He said, you got it. You got it. I'm telling you, it takes faith. But what is faith? Faith is that which desires to attach to him more than to stay with your own identity. It says, man, I'd rather be with you than me. And that, that doesn't, isn't this how it begins? My soul longeth even fainteth for your courts. I, I want to be back. You know, and you step in, we're back. You know what I mean? You step back into this realm of foundation. Because think about it. He didn't just lay a big old foundation all over the globe. And then anywhere you go. You see what I'm saying? He laid a foundation of the house. Those who are one and say, yes, I will, you know, return here. And wasn't that really Israel when they went into captivity for messing up and getting out of whack with God? The whole cry of God was, return unto me. But it always meant return back to the house, rebuild Jerusalem. It always did. Come back and build this thing again because that's who you are. You are living stones. That's who you are. It's not just what you're doing. It's who you are. And it's who you will always be. You, you, that doesn't change. We, our moods change. I, you know, I know my mood changes, but I know another thing too. And I know that when my feelings, you, anybody ever have feelings about something? You know? And when my feelings, you know, finally subside, I know where I'm gonna be, right back in line, right? standing on the rock, standing with the Lord. And so I just, you know, in some cases I say, you know what, feelings don't mean anything and I just get up and go. Other times the feelings feel like they're all over me and they, you know, at that time, have you ever felt that and it feels more real than anything else? But in your spirit, you just go, okay, I can wait this out. I can wait this out because I know whom I have believed. It didn't say I know what I believe. He says, I know whom, you know. I don't believe a what. 
I don't believe a set of doctrine. I believe in Jesus. And that's, that's the key. So let's see. Uh, I'm getting the, the thing that I've only got a few minutes here. Maybe I can just read this through and then we'll, we'll stop. Um, so uh, those who find strength, their strength in me, we are the house and he is the strength in us. He dwells in our heart where his ways abound. Um, and that's verse 7. They go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion and appeareth before God. Um, so I want you to notice um, that they, they go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion and appeareth. But, but where do they go? How do they get there? They have to pass through verse 6. You can't get to verse 7 unless you go through verse 6. Can I get a, oh me. Who passing through the valley of Baca. What's the word Baca mean? Weeping. Oh, you got to pass through that, huh? Yes, you do. Uh, let's see. This speaks of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All Israel had to make a long journey during the feast, but their goal was to come to Zion. And that's what this is talking about. Passing through, you've got to go through this, you've got to go through this area, but you're not all caught up in the trip. Your heart is caught up in Zion. The house of God, Zion. That's what Zion was. The house of God, the place that God found habitation. Another word for it, the bride of Christ. However you want to look at it, but it is where he inhabits us and we are one with him and we believe it. We've made a, a marriage pact, if you will. Okay? And so they had to, they had to make this pilgrimage. That was built into their system. All of them had to do it. It was built into their system. Every one of them to get to Zion every year, every time, for every feast, they had to go through certain valleys and realms and go through certain hard things and dry places and all this kind of stuff. And, but their heart had to say, I want to get to Jerusalem. I want to get to Zion. And so that's why it says in verse 6, who passing through the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping. All right? So um, this speaks of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All Israel had to make a long journey during the feast, but their goal was to come to Zion, to make the pilgrim, pilgrimage to the true Zion of God's heart requires a walk of trials through a valley of tears. We pass through the valley of weeping. The trials and tears do not destroy us, but are made into a well that waters what is dry. Is that not what it says? Verse 6. Who passing through the valley of weeping, make it a well. All those tears make a well, and it's like rain that fills the pool. It begins to fill up and clear up. And, you know, <clears throat> uh, I remember... Uh, I remember going through a trial some years ago, and I, I wept and wept and wept. And it just seemed like I couldn't stop crying. And I just wept and wept and wept. And one, one day after just so long, I mean, I just thought I, I'm just going to cry my whole life. One day, certain things just began to dawn on me. And it was like I had little, what did Jesus call it, uh, things in your eyes, you know? Scales. Yeah, or, or scales or whatever, thing, particles in your eyes and stuff. And all that crying just began to wash it out. It was just the weirdest thing. Clarity started coming at the end of the weeping. There shall be weeping for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Okay, when the sun comes up, when the clarity comes, when, the, when you begin to see. And I began to see a little more clearly what it was, and all of that weeping had put me in a position of brokenness where God could show me things that I needed to see. And that's, that's you know, you, you, you don't live in the Valley of Baca. You live in the house of God, but you have to pass through it, okay? And, and it's meant to bring about wells that can take care of the dry, dry places. Uh, so let me read this last statement, and then we'll take a break. They go from strength to strength, all those who appear, all those who appear, they're found to appear as part of Zion. 
They, they're found to appear. When, when he shall appear, we, we shall be changed. We'll be like him. We, we will see him as he is. All those scriptures. Um, because we don't know who we are until he appears. We don't know who we are. We think we're this and we think we're that. We've got our parents' opinion and somebody else's opinion and all this. Folks, nobody's opinion of who you are counts except the Holy Spirit's opinion because he'll tell you who you are in Christ. And that's the only thing that's important. And who you are in Christ is nothing like who you are apart from Christ. <laughs> all right, let's take a break and we'll, we'll come back.